Hi, this presentation describes a simple view of reading. If you understand what the simple view is, it's going to serve as a framework for all that you do when you teach or assess reading. So let's get started. If you watch or have watched any of the other presentations in this series, you know that I like to start by showing the text or materials that influence the material in the presentation um, or I start with some easy to access information so you can go back to learn more once the presentation is complete. For this particular presentation on the simple view of reading, I'm going to suggest two chapters that I wrote for an open access, meaning free, literacy textbook. The chapters here are directly related to the simple view of reading and they're going to serve as a resource to provide some evidence-based instructional strategies you can use based on what you learn here. So if you want to go back to check them out, that's where you can find them. They're online for free. I don't think anyone involved in literacy education would disagree that the ultimate goal uh, when we teach someone to read is that they learn to read well enough so they comprehend text. It's all about the meaning. We all agree with that. Uh, we want them to comprehend what they read in school, whatever they might choose to read for pleasure. And so comprehension is the pot of gold at the end of the literacy education rainbow, right? This presentation, I hope, will show you uh, the simple view of reading and help you understand it. It's a research validated framework and it shows that there are two major components necessary for reading comprehension for our goal. It's The simple view has been researched or at least mentioned in well over a hundred studies and it's important for you to know about because as an educator, it'll serve you so well as, a, as kind of like an overarching guide for how you assess and how you instruct. It's absolutely enlightening for instructors once they know about it. And one research um, instructor recently told me, it's so pleasingly lo logical in, and it does have appeal, logic, it's prevalent. And yet, despite all this, many people have never even heard of the simple view of reading. What is it? All right. It's very well known not just to researchers though but to policy makers and I just want to point this out in fact 10 years ago in 2006 the UK the United Kingdom adopted this simple view of reading into its primary national reading strategy part of word reading related to helping children learn to decode versus instructional methods that lead to guessing um, is in align the part here it's in alignment with the simple view as you will see New Zealand is supposed to be doing something similar for students that have dyslexia and here in the U.S. some of our core curricula that we use in classrooms is in alignment with the simple view but you might not have ever recognized it um, but it's it's there. Alright so since 1986 two um, researchers Goff and Tumner came up with a simple view of reading they wrote about it it's a formula for what's needed for reading comprehension simply put if you can't decode, and by decoding they meant reading words outside of context, if you can't get the words off of a page or off of paper, there's not going to be any reading comprehension. And similarly, um, if comprehension of language is meeting and, uh, missing, and by that um, they were talking about the ability to derive meaning from spoken words as they are in a sentence or in discourse, this includes receptive vocabulary, hearing words and stuff, and understanding grammar and understanding discourse. So, but if, if that, here it is yellow, if that language comprehension is missing for a passage, comprehension won't occur. So some people get confused when they see language comprehension and reading comprehension here on these, uh, on the yellow and on the pot of gold. Reading comprehension um, represents print. Mathematically then, you know, if reading comprehension, our goal, it, it's the product of decoding and language comprehension. Um, you need to be able to understand the words and you need to be able to decode the words. If, if one of those components is lacking, reading comprehension is going to be um, negatively impacted. The simple view helps us as educators by pointing to where we need to teach. This is a quick example. Here are some words in Hebrew, Arabic, and a couple other scripts. If you can't read these because you don't know how to decode those languages, there's going to be, you're going to have to plug in a zero for D, for decoding, and as a result, 
do the mathematical math or the formula here and you're not going to be able to comprehend it. You also get a zero for reading comprehension. Take a look at this simulation. I'll pause here for a few seconds. All right, here it's likely that you can decode and read these words, and you might even be able to answer a couple of the questions correctly. But again, there's no reading comprehension because this time, even if I read it to you, you don't comprehend the words. There's no language comprehension of these words or the sentences that they're in. Um, at this point, it's, I'm going to remind you why it's called the simple view of reading. This is an illustration from Hollis Scarborough, um, 2001. It's very, very widely depicted in the reading research world. It's probably in a number of these books I have sitting here, and it's seen a lot in articles and chapters and textbooks. It breaks down the various components um, that lead to skilled reading, which is pictured here as fluent execution and coordination of word recognition and text comprehension. Wow, a lot of words. The ropes in this illustration represent the underlying skills and elements that come together and form the two necessary braids, representing those two essential components of reading comprehension, word recognition or decoding, and language comprehension. When we think about it, it's simple because we see that reading comprehension requires automatic um, reading of words, the bottom braid there you see it, and strategic application of what we know about our language. Um, a researcher did a great job in 2007, Kami, um, I think it was, pointing out that something that isn't obvious in this illustration and something that people tend to miss. He reminded us that word recognition is a teachable skill. We can teach the underlying skills required for it. We can teach them phonological awareness, alphabetic, pieces, the sounds, we can have them recognize words by sight, and we can, this all happens with increased automaticity. There's something that students learn in their first few years of school, and they become increasingly automatic and fluent and easy as kids master each one. Note that the arrow at the bottom says increasingly automatic. This is because typical readers' brains become able to notice and manipulate phonemes automatically. They see letters and automatically notice that those are the sounds and words and they develop a large pool of words that they can read automatically and they can even start to learn to read never seen before words pretty automatically. Conversely, the elements needed for language comprehension aren't skills uh, per se. They are mental processes and they're really difficult to teach and they develop over our entire lifetimes. Um, Kami, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, pointed out that Comprehending our language is made even more complex a task because it's really domain specific. We probably comprehend the words and language in a text about farm animals, farm animals a lot more easily than we would a text about how amino acids form proteins. We can teach comprehension strategies all day long, but if the content and the words aren't familiar, comprehension is going to be minimal. So this is why the best predictor of reading comprehension isn't reading comprehension strategies, but content domain. So what's, what's the book about? What's the text about? Um, according to Willingham, um, this is the case, language comprehension, background knowledge, vocabulary knowledge, and knowledge of um, language structures, verbal reasoning, all these things here, they develop over time. And so as they develop, the reader has to become increasingly strategic when they apply them in this text versus that text in order to comprehend each one. So one braid is that the skills become automatic and the other braid is that the aspects become more strategic. Okay. Um, the simple view, very, very valuable for assessment. Uh, previous slides here, we had inserting a zero or a one for decoding or a zero or a one for language comprehension. It's not really realistic since students aren't going to get a zero on, in something or a perfect score on something. They're going to be, you know, pretty good or fairly good at things. Here are a few scenarios. Student A can decode um, and get most words correct despite it taking a lot of uh, effort still. For this reason, she gets a 45% on a decoding test. Her vocabulary and language comprehension are fantastic. She scores a 95 in this area. 
So we multiply the two and we see she's still going to do pretty poorly on a comprehension test because of the simple view we can see why. Um, student B has difficulty with language comprehension. That's like even when a story is read to him, he has difficulty understanding it. <clears throat> but he can decode and read words accurately and automatically. So his scores, if we multiply them together, also predict a low reading comprehension score as a result. Because of the simple view, this mathematical model, we can readily see why student, student B has difficulty and we can plan our assessments and our instructions accordingly. Finally, student C, um, kind of low in both component areas. Can we result, can we predict a 65 in comprehension test? No, because if we multiply 65 times 65, or 0 0.65, 0 0.65, we get a 0.42. It's a compound effect. So both of those being low is like a double whammy on the reading comprehension. This makes sense when you think of students who have difficulty reading words and difficulty knowing the word, what the words mean and the language and the text. Their reading comprehension is hit from both sides, so to speak. All right. Kind of clever and cool. This um, last slide, the simple view, is also valuable when specifying the reasons why um, a student's reading comprehension is good or poor. Um, for both components, word recognition or language comprehension, it's on a continuum. You can see the horizontal axis. A student's word recognition ability can be low or really, really good. And the axes in this diagram are arrows representing each component. They're gonna, students are going to fall somewhere along each axis for word rec, like all word recognition, word rec, or language comprehension. If you look in the upper right hand corner, the student is strong in both components. We would consider this a, you know, that's what they call a typical reader in the research. If we look in the lower right corner, it's is a really rare profile where a student can read words really automatically, but has language comprehension difficulty they would probably have difficulty comprehending text, this is the one we talked about, even if it was read to them. They can read text at a higher grade level than they can comprehend it. Um, students with this profile might be those who have a speech or language impairment or an intellectual disability such as Down syndrome. In the upper right corner, we now see students whose language comprehension is fine, but reading words is difficult. I think I mean upper left corner. <laughs> this profile is typical of students with um, dyslexia or students who are referred to as compensating readers. Um, both their language, and compre uh, language comprehension and word recognition abilities are usually in the average range. Um, Kilpatrick in this book here, according to him, families and teachers know something's not quite right and um, there's something, hmm, they're not performing to their true abilities and they are usually compensated for some weakness early on in their reading difficulty by memorizing words, for example. So if you want more explanation on this type of student, if you are working with someone and want to know more, um, check that out. Um, the lower left-hand corner here, students have difficulty with both components required for reading comprehension. Okay, poor language comprehension, poor word reading. So now we see that the simple view can help us understand why a student's reading comprehension isn't where it should be. And we w wonder this all the time about students. It's not where it should be for their grade level. So we can go back to the simple view and see what it means for our instruction. I lied. It's not, that wasn't the last slide. <laughs> Let's look at another way of looking at the simple view. There's our pot of gold on the right. It's where we're all aiming to get our students. And just to the left of the pot of reading comprehension gold are the two components we've covered, automatic word recognition and language comprehension. There are two keys under those boxes to signify that reading comprehension is really like a two-lock box. Um, you need both keys to turn in order to free up reading comprehension. So here's how this map works. First, we ask ourselves this question. Does this student understand text if I read them to him? Can he answer comprehension questions after he's been read to? If yeah. Um, we would probably be okay in thinking that language comprehension for this student is not the primary issue with why they're not comprehending text. Next question. When the student reads out loud, does it sound effortless? Or there, are there a lot of errors, hesitations, self-corrections? Uh, are they repeating a lot? Are there pauses? Is there flat expression? If the answer to this question is yes, 
then we would be correct to say that automatic word recognition is not happening for the student. Now, notice the blue arrow pointing to the left above automatic word recognition. This means that we have to dig deeper now to see why that student's word recognition is taking so much effort. Keep going to the left. Why is that student uh, not able to have a pool of words that can just be read by sight? See the presentation in the series on orthographic mapping and sight words for what we mean by that, um, mapping words to memory and how that happens. Can't do it in this presentation, but similar to Scarborough's rope of the simple view that we saw a few slides ago, if we keep working backwards, we now have to face some more questions. How proficient is this student in phonemic proficiency? Not just segmenting and blending if they're past first grade either, even if they're in late elementary or middle school or higher, are they able to respond correctly and automatically if you ask them, say, say croak, now say croak, but instead of er, say ooh, would they be able to automatically tell you cloak? Um, I really, really recommend that you um, check this book out for more on that. But moving on, how is the student's letter sound proficiency? Ask yourself that question. Can they look at letters and letter combinations in a word, A-U, say, and instantly pronounce the correct sound, or is there a delay? Do they go, when they look at A-U, go, mmm, it, it should be ah, quick. And also, how is their decoding ability? Do they know how to attack an unknown word and sound it out using phonetic or phonic elements like syllable types, the silent E and the air control and so on and so forth? Another presentation is on that. So here's your keys. Ask yourself after, from your, you know, using your knowledge of your students or better yet, some really good valid assessments and then pinpoint your instruction to address those issues all the way on the left. There's no way to leapfrog to the pot of gold if the frog's underlying legs are weak. If <laughs> you're more, you'd like more information on strategies for these underlying issues, read the chapter suggested at the beginning of this presentation. That's where there's some instructional advice. And please remember that we can implement fluency building activities and teach reading comprehension strategies until the proverbial cows come home. But unless those underlying skills that actually create fluency and comprehension are firmly developed, we're probably misplacing our efforts. All right. Okay, that was a quick one. Thank you for participating in this knowledge series. It's great that you're here. I hope you continue to invest in your knowledge as an educator, and I welcome you to contact me at any time for further information. I hope you'll watch other presentations here, as a lot of them are very tied together. Taking part in one might lead to an aha moment in the next one. Okay, thanks a lot.